Hello, everyone. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Hetnets and Small Cells, presented by Enritu. Our presenter today is Rick Fong, Strategic Business Development Manager at Enritu. And at this time, I would like to hand the presentation over to Rick. Thank you, Kyle. And hi, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, this is uh, a new topic that we're presenting. Today's um, webinar is on heterogeneous network and small cells. And uh, so this is about overview of technology and the standards and we'll be um, going to affecting the industry right now and then at the end we'll have a Q&A session where um, feel free to post questions and, uh, and ask. So uh, a little bit about myself and, uh, and Ritsu. Uh, we are a global company of uh, we manufacture test equipment for all the industries, and um, the one that I'm focusing on today is on uh, wireless test me and measurement, which is aimed mostly at LTE and cellular technology, but we also have products that support uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other type of uh, technology, Ethernet, um, and so forth. Um, I've been with the company about three years, and uh, I've been in the industry about 20 years in wireless and telecom and uh, in different capacity working in technical sides as well as marketing and product management side. But uh, today's uh, presentation is really a kind of high overview, a little bit about technology, a little bit about the market, what's driving the, the, uh, the need for small cells and uh, facing the challenges, challenges faced by operators today for meeting capacity and coverage. So um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and start the presentation. So this is a kind of overview of uh, what we'll be covering. Um, just an introduction to small cells and, and HetNet. Uh, those terms you probably hear interchangeably, but they're quite interrelated, and I, I'll explain what each of those mean. Then I'll go a little bit into the, uh, the details of what the benefits of small cells versus uh, macro cells, and what's happening in the market today in terms of deployment of small cells. Uh, we'll, then we'll talk about some of the challenges facing the deployment of small, small cells and um, and then some of the testing challenges in terms of the user equipment as well as network and wrap up with a summary of uh, where the market is today and what we probably see uh, happening in the market in the next uh, 12 to 16, 18 months. So to start off, uh, what's, the, what's the driver, what's driving the market to consider small cell and headnet? Um, mainly it's because of the growth, the explosive growth in mobile data. Um, as we've all seen, there's all kinds of report statistics all pointing to the fact that uh, mobile data is grow growing year over year very, very quickly. And uh, this particular, this is just one of many studies and, and statistics I put out. This one's for, published by Cisco, but saying that mobile data itself is uh, tripling or even 5x over the next few years. And mostly it's driven by video. Uh, but not only that, it's that the portion that is driven by video tends to tends to actually um, go even higher. Right now, we're currently in about 65%, 70%. Previously, it was 60%. So it's projected to actually reach even 8% of the total volume of, of mobile data. And the data itself is actually you know, growing very quickly um, year over year. And secondarily is this number of devices that are connecting to all the mobile networks. Uh, there are some studies saying that in uh, for the next five years, really, the number of devices, it's, it's going to be 10 times as many devices as we have today. So the, the volume of data, the number of connectivities that the networks worldwide are going to be uh, supporting is, is a huge number. But lastly, the most important point is that uh, operators really looking to expand their network and increase coverage and capacity, really, uh, because uh, of the demand, but because they need a way to figure out how to deliver that data more cost effectively uh, today. The, the cost of delivering one gigabyte of data is not coming down as quickly as the as the as what the users are really paying for it. So the R pool for data is actually decreasing at a rate that's faster than any any uh, uh, cost reduction can be had from increasing capacity using LTE vans, carrier aggregation. All those technology can reduce the, the cost of delivering the data, but it's not coming fast coming down as fast as as uh, as the, uh, the the price the users are paying. So in a way, for the operator, they're kind of forced into a difficult position where the margin is actually squeezed down to zero effectively. And uh, so they need to actually keep up with that trend. And uh, small sales and headnet is, is a way to do that. So let's go ahead and talk about um, what is a small cell. Uh, it's just a way of a common understanding what it is. 
and what HeadNet is. So this is definition I just pulled from the small cell form, but, but uh, other places have similar definition. Basic small cells are like a, like a micro cell, but they're small in several aspects. It's small in terms of the radius of the coverage. That is, it, it covers a smaller area. It's uh, small in terms of power output. As you can see at the bottom there in red, those are the typical type of small cells compared to a macro cell. And uh, also the number of users. So typically a small cell, you can see there, it's um, support on the order of uh, maybe 100 users, maybe 200 users. They uh, consume much less power. Uh, they also transmit much lower power. So the power to consume is actually in the order of, of watts. And as such, it doesn't require any active cooling, any moving parts, any fans, which reduces the cost of the cell, the equipment itself, but also uh, reduces the cost of maintaining the site and any facilities that are needed to support that cell. So if you think about a, a, a small cell, it's really kind of like a Wi-Fi access point that you may have at home. It's really just a passive equipment that's, that's uh, installed and uh, operates about that same power and same um, coverage area. And lastly, small in terms of physical size, you think of a, a small cell nowadays, a lot of companies are, are building and, and marketing small cells. They're really on the order of fractional cubic foot, like a quarter to a half cubic foot, or five to 10 liters of volume. And uh, if you think about that, that's, that's the typical size of, say, a, a kitchen toaster, for example, if you can imagine. That's what a small cell would be in physical size. And that allows it to be easily installed in places uh, you know, almost anywhere, it doesn't need to go up on a tower. In fact, a lot of deployment will be at street level, and we'll talk about that and how that's used. So uh, for comparison there, you see a table at the bottom. The uh, macro cell today, I mean, of course, it has uh, it can range from hundreds of meters to even uh, dozens of uh, kilometers in, in terms of radius. But typically, they're, they're about one kilometer, uh, the, the typical size. And then small cells are the three types you, you see listed below in red. We have an uh, outdoor micro cell, which is similar to a macro cell, uh, but smaller radius and smaller in terms of power. And uh, pico cell, which is smaller still and used in a different environment. Uh, and typically they're in, deployed in a uh, enterprise environment. For example, if you think about a large campus or perhaps a university or, or a shopping center. Whereas a uh, micro cell, more public spaces like a large uh, transportation hub, like an airport or a train station. And then finally, femto cell, which is more like a Wi-Fi access point at home, and those are typically could be installed and deployed by the end user, or could be installed by the network. But they really they serve a small number of users per cell and much much lower power. So those are the types. That's what we mean when we say small cells uh, in terms of coverage, power, and and size. Okay. And um, next, we'll talk about um, HetNet or hetero heterogeneous network. So you hear that term quite a lot and uh, as, as related to small cells. And what it really means is that uh, it's a topology of cells where you combine the macro cell work, uh, working alongside with femto cells and pico cells and, and micro cells. So uh, this is a picture I took from, from a Qualcomm presentation. I think it, it's actually uh, really well illustrate what, what that means. So on the left there you have a, uh, well, look, let's look at the middle, the, the, micro, uh, the macro cell. So this is your typical cellular network that we have today, uh, mounted on high, high up, uh, on towers with antennas, and then they have, um, they're a uh, backhaul using fiber or gigabit Ethernet. And then um, on the right side there, we have a micro, macro, cell, uh, a micro cell. So these are lower power. Uh, they could be deployed by the operator, or they could be deployed by a third party, or even the uh, 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 a third party uh, in a system integrator or such. And typically, they could be indoor, outdoor, um, closer to street level, because the, the size themselves, the, the cell size themselves, are smaller. And on the left there, you have femto cells and, and even Wi-Fi access point. Um, so, um, headnet doesn't necessarily mean cellular technology. It could also include Wi-Fi and uh, 3G and LTE alongside each other. So, in this case, a femto cell would be deployed by the end user, and um, there could be many hundreds of thousands of them, or even millions of them. Uh, in the network. Okay, next we'll talk about uh, the uh, benefits of small cells. So obviously by by increasing the number of cells, we can increase the capacity, uh, barring issues of interference. 
and, and we'll talk about that how how interference can be managed and how that can be mitigated to uh, so that it doesn't uh, reduce the capacity overall of the network. Um, but basically, when you add more cells to the network, obviously you would get more capacity. Um, and in that case, in the case of LT, that's especially true because uh, LT most deployment use uh, use factor of one, meaning all the cells use all the frequencies that are allocated to it. So instead of allocating a uh, portion of frequency to each cell, you actually allow all the cells to use all the frequency. So if you think about adding, let's say, doubling number of cells by, let's say you have 100 micro cells and you add additional 100 micro cells or small cells to the network, that really increases the capacity because um, each cell then have, have capacity X. And now since you have two X um, number of cells, that would be double. So increasing capacity is the most important thing. A second really factor for operators really improving coverage. Uh, micro cell work well on outdoor environment, but um, as as people spend more time indoor and accessing the network and mobile data indoor, or in, in urban canyons where there are tall buildings where the path uh, there's a great path loss, there's actually a need to improve coverage and putting more macro cells high up on buildings and tower does not necessarily achieve that goal. So small cells allow that to be uh, the case. Uh, small cells uh, tend to can be deployed indoor, they can be deployed at street level, they can be deployed in the, or even outdoor environment, but uh, like a university campus. So you can really improve coverage in spots where there are holes of coverage from the larger macro network. So that's the second benefit. Uh, the third one is really reduced cost. And we'll, we'll, on the next page, we'll see some of the studies that are happening. But uh, a lot of the industry now are, are looking at this as a way to reduce the costs on the order of you know, one half or even one third or one quarter compared to macro cell deployment. Um, so typically, a macro cell would be you know, on order of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the equipment themselves and maybe a million dollars to, uh, to operate and run the network over X number of years, say five to eight years. And the, uh, the, the small cells would be maybe $100,000 for the cell or $50,000 to $100,000 for the to hardware and the network. And the operating cost will be also a fraction of that. Uh, third is the reduced power consumption in the device themselves. So because, and, and this really relates to the coverage and the deployment model uh, because the, the uh, cell sites are closer to the actual users and because of the less path loss. Uh, there's less power that's required from the UE themselves to, to broadcast and transmit. So it improves battery life in the device themselves, but also re reduce power consumption in, in the, uh, the network as well. And uh, lastly, it's improving connectivity. Uh, and that's really measured by in, in terms of metrics of uh, cell completion, as a call completion and uh, call retention. So that, that means, uh, firstly, the number of call attempts that are initiated, how many of those actually go through. Um, from from landline and 3G and LT, uh, you sort of come to really come to expect a 99.5 or 99.9 percent .9 completion rate. So I mean, anything more than a few calls out of thousands not being able to complete, it's really seen as a, as a as a uh, network problem. Um, so operators don't want to to, have to um, deal with that. Uh, and the second metric is really call retention. So how 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 does the call stay up? Uh, how often does a call get dropped? And uh, you know, the same similar type of uh, KPI, really 99% or higher in terms of uh, call retention rate. So you can't really drop more than say a few calls out of a thousand to to keep up with that kind of kind of um, metric. And thirdly, is really uh, call delay. Uh, it's it's we have come to expect you know end-to-end -end delay from anywhere in the world to any anywhere else in the world of a quarter second or around that that uh, the range should be the maximum delay that we want to experience in a call. So uh, that call and QS will be, have to be managed in, in order to achieve all those metrics to improve uh, connectivity. So those, those are the benefits of small cells. And next we'll talk about uh, one study, but there are many studies that have come up with similar conclusion, and that is uh, the cost of small cells is much lower than the macro cell or the larger cells. So in this case, this is one study uh, sponsored by the Small Cell Forum, and it's looking at uh, cost of ownership, total cost of ownership in terms of capex to deploy a cell, and also opex over eight years. And uh, it's it's a little bit uh, confusing, but basically the, the chart is showing the cost per megabyte, per, uh, per megabit of uh, per second of data speed. 
So if you take a typical cell, let's say LTE cell of 150 megabits per second, what that translates to is a macro cell costing 780K um, for CapEx and OpEx over eight years. Uh, contrast that with a small cells using that scale, it would be less than about a third of that, a 290K uh, to de deploy a cell as well as to operate and run it and maintain it over that same period. So this is um, one study and it takes into account things like it's, it's um, the same type of backhaul we use, uh, same type of traffic loading, same type of environment and deployment uh, sometime about now, the late 2014 or 2015 timeframe. And this is to, to demonstrate uh, the cost difference between a, a small cell and micro cell. Uh, next, I'd like to go over some of the market updates, but this is just a, a snapshot of what happening in the, in the market today in terms of small cell deployment. So uh, SK Telecom in, in South Korea is really heading the charge on this. Um, they were the first one to actually have a, a large scale deployment of um, small cell into their macro cell network. And uh, they've actually been doing this for about a year now. I think it started early last year in terms of adding micro cells. I think right now they have a, 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 a tens of thousands of, of micro cells, uh, maybe even 100,000 micro cells by now in their network, so, uh, mostly in the Seoul area, but also in, uh, in the outside of Seoul. And uh, recently they have added uh, EICIC, which is an interference management technology. That's part of LTE Advance. Um, it's, uh, it's able to, uh, SK Telecom is able to use this in the network because uh, we'll see later, interference is actually a big challenge for small cells because you have so many cells that are next to each other, so many cells that are uh, overlapping. And so interference is a way to, um, to maintain that increase in capacity. Uh, without a uh, mechanism by EICIC, it, any, any benefit that you could get from deploying more cells would simply generate more interference. And uh, so uh, interference is really a key to deploying effective uh, head net with small cells. Uh, next is the, the uh, recent announcement by Vodafone at the end of last year that they've signed a agreement with uh, an advertising firm, uh, uh, JC Deco. And this is actually a, a a typical, I, I would say, very good example of how small cells could be deployed uh, effectively. So uh, JC Deco, this, this advertising firm, owns a lot of what they call street furniture. That is outdoor billboard, uh, bus stops, and, uh, what, and, and signposts at street level, which, are, which have power, which have uh, a lot of visibility. And uh, Vodafone signs agreement with them to in, basically install small cells into those um, uh, street furniture. So if you imagine the people waiting at the bus stop would get cell coverage that is from a small cell extending maybe uh, 100 meters from that cell site. And uh, at the same time, the cell could be using the power that's already available. Uh, it's really just a matter of providing backhaul and, and installing those cells, uh, tens of thousands of those cells across a city in order to provide this coverage. So I think that's, that's a really a, a good example of how small cell could be effectively deployed. Uh, in this agreement, actually, they, um, the advertising company is actually designing the, the housing the outer housing of, of the unit in order to blend in the small cells along with the surrounding. So that you won't see, you know, huge white gray boxes with antennas sticking out. It will actually be covered up so that uh, it, will be, it will be basically um, unobtrusive. It will be, uh, it will blend in with, with the environment. Okay. And lastly, it's, it's a article actually provided by uh, the small cell forum and the statistics a little bit old from a year ago, but basically say worldwide right now there's um, you know, about, about 8 million small cells. Um, most of them are residential femtocells, cells. So these are like access point that you would install in a home, but um, instead of Wi-Fi, they're, they're actually LTE or LTE advanced cellular technology. Uh, cellular technology. Uh, that's by far the largest number. Uh, however, ever, there's also deployment in enterprise. You can see there, there's actually over 100,000 uh, enterprise-based small cells, as well as uh, 120,000 indoor or urban small cells. Those, so these are deployment in, say, uh, a uh, a company campus or a university campus, a a uh, kind, of, kind of private public space. Uh, and indoor could be it could be anything. It could be inside a coffee shop, a shopping center, a train station, airport, 
uh, those are places where coverage is very difficult for macro cells, so it makes a good business case to deploy these uh, small cells in those environments. And then lastly, there's also a outdoor small cell deployment for uh, rural and uh, urban areas. So at, at about a year ago, there was actually 64 operators that have already uh, completed trials and started commercial deployment of small cells um, using what we defined earlier as, as small cell compared to a macro cell. Okay, um, next I'd like to talk about some of the challenges for, um, for small cells. We talked about the benefits, but uh, obviously nothing comes, from, comes free. So there are challenges, and, uh, and we'll go through some of the key ones right now. First and foremost is siting. So siting is really the uh, selection and uh, ch choosing of a site and also gaining access to the site. Um, that, that sounds simple enough, but really it's, it's a, there are many facets to that. There are a lot of regulatory implications. Uh, because now you're installing something, some equipment outside. It could be on lamp posts, it could be at bus stops, it could be on street corners. Those actually uh, have different regulatory requirements depending on what city you're deploying in. Um, there's, and of course, there's also federal requirements in terms of power output. Uh, because now you're really deploying a equipment that is uh, not on a cell tower, hundreds of feet up in the air, but um, really at, at street level. And uh, of course, it has to be unobtrusive because a lot of cities, especially in Europe, they, they don't want any kind of outdoor furniture that would um, take away from the, the city, the beauty of the city itself. And of course, it, the, the unit has to be compact and lightweight, so it's easily um, hideable, if you will, and, uh, and installable and replaceable uh, quickly. So that, that's really one, one challenge. And even though it's two bullets, there there's, could be whole discussions about that. Uh, but just keep in mind that siting, uh, selecting sites, is, is a huge factor. And, and small cells tend to be much higher number in the network eventually than the number of macro cells. So for example, a, a, a heterogeneous network could have a hundred, uh, could have a thousand micro cells, but it could have tens of thousands or a hundred thousand micro cells. So the, each of those cells have to be um, installed and sited and uh, maintained. Uh, next is uh, providing power. Uh, we use the example of the advertising sign, so the power there is not so much issues. But you have to consider that uh, the number of cells that have to be deployed at street level, uh, running power to all of them is going to be a huge headache, actually. And uh, of course, all the cells do have to have some kind of battery backup in case of uh, a power outage or um, accidental uh, disconnecting of power to any of those uh, locations. Uh, third is backhaul. That is providing capacity to to connect that back to the network. And um, there's really two models. One is a capacity driven, and one's coverage driven. So if you're deploying a small cell that's uh, and you're deploying for capacity requirement, you really want to have the backhaul that can um, operate up to that that cell's uh, maximum throughput. Uh, so, for example, if you have a cell that's capable of 150 megabits, you really want to provide enough backhaul to reach that speed. Uh, whereas for coverage-driven, um, you're really just providing coverage. You're not really, not really expecting to hit the peak traffic, but uh, in that case, you can then uh, back off a little bit in terms of requirements of uh, the backhaul. And uh, one thing to keep in mind about backhaul is, is that because there's so many cells and they're at street level where Things can happen, uh, digging a trench, uh, plumbing, anything that can happen to cut the cable or your connection on the backhaul. So the, uh, the network really needs to have a way to auto-configure or, or reconfigure itself quickly to maintain coverage and uh, quality of service. And, and also at the same time, we keep in mind that uh, because of small cell and their deployment, oftentimes the backhaul may not be um, totally owned by the operator themselves. It could be lease line. It could be, you know, for example, if it's in a in a uh, large shopping complex, that backhaul could be Ethernet that's already installed in the building, and so therefore the operator, even though they are not owning the complete network, they do have to maintain the network so that it can switch over, can reconfigure itself uh, when when cells drop out, when cells come back in. All that has to be done in real time. So um, that requires. Uh, careful management of all the cells and, uh, and uh, taking into account that backhaul is not as reliable as uh, on the macro cell. Uh, next is interference. We talk about we talk a little bit about how interference could be a problem and how we can get around that. So interference now we have considered interference between small cells 
because they, these will be deployed, say, you know, 100 to 200 meters apart in a dense urban environment. Um, and also interference with the macro cells. So it requires tight synchronization between the cells to make sure that, uh, 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 and we'll talk about how the different interference uh, methodology can use that, but it requires tight interference in terms of timing and in terms of frequency to really reduce the interference between all the cells. And uh, related to that interference is really some kind of advanced interference cancellation technique to to uh, ensure that any capacity gain by in installing more cells is not lost to the fact that you're also creating more interference in that in that same environment. Okay. And uh, mobility management. It's just really uh, managing interference as devices or people move across a cell. For example, if you have a um, uh, a small cell deploy in the urban environment and someone drives through that, that street block. They could be on a macro cell, but then they enter in a small cell and then they quickly leave it within a few seconds. You know, the, the, the mobility management has to know that you probably don't want to hand over to, to, the, to the small cell or micro cell for a few seconds and then hand back to a larger cell. So it has to be able to have some intelligence to tell which type, which calls should be handed over between the larger macro cells and the small cells, and which cost should not be. And uh, because if it too, too, if handover happened too often, it could impact capacity. And if it doesn't happen often enough, it may be, uh, be a, a call, call drop. Okay. And lastly, so security concern. Uh, it's, it's, security is always concerned for any kind of a network, but particularly for small cell because now the, 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 the cells themselves are actually physically close to where the users are. They're deployed at street level. So there's actually physical security, how to, how to uh, uh, secure the equipment. And then there's, of course, uh, security in terms of, um, of uh, the data backhaul, the data network, uh, in terms of uh, hacking and, and uh, DOS attack and so forth. So those, those are the challenges a lot of operators will have to think about and consider and overcome uh, to deploy small cells. But it, it certainly, uh, small cells certainly have its benefit in terms of uh, providing coverage and capacity. Okay. So next we'll talk about some of the technology that can be used to uh, mitigate some of those uh, challenges. Uh, first and foremost is the, the cell range expansion. This is, this is a way to it's really a, a, a um, cell selection algorithm that's, that's deployed in the network and then co takes coordination between the device themselves and the network in terms of selecting which cell a device should camp on. So if you think about how a small cell, as we mentioned, is much higher power output compared to a, 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 a micro cell, if, if a user is within the range of a, of a micro cell, it should be connected to a micro cell However, the, the micro cell has much higher broadcast power, so output power. So in most instances, it would actually see the micro cell as a cell that it should camp on. And uh, so cell range expansion is, is a way, it's actually an algorithm that adds an offset to the uh, receive power in order to basically force the UE, the device, to, to select the smaller cell, even though it has a lower power. Uh, the reason you want to do that is because the smaller cell has less path loss, which contributes to uh, saving power, battery power in the device, but it also improves um, uplink. Uh, remember, the device is limited in terms of how much power it can put out in order to send data to the, to the network. And um, uh, if it has to boost its power in order to reach a, the larger macro cell, it's actually using more power than it should. Uh, meanwhile, if there's a smaller mi micro cell nearby, it could connect to that. Now, even though the, trans the, uh, the, the power is lower on that micro cell, it is actually a better uh, link, better connection, because it's using less energy, but and also because it's closer. So um, micro cell and micro cell deployment, uh, head net deployment actually introduces this, this type of issue where you have a huge difference in terms of power between the larger cell and smaller cells. And uh, cell range expansion is a, is, a, is a way to manage the cell selection. Uh, it's really an algorithm that chooses the difference of the power based on, and, and it can be selected by the uh, operator in terms of how many dBs uh, difference to, to introduce in that algorithm. Uh, next is some, some of the interference management techniques. So uh, EICIC was uh, introduced in release eight, and then uh, EICIC 
and is in layer release. And really, there are ways to coordinate cells so that they don't interfere with each other. Um, ICIC is really a frequency domain interference. So basically, you take interf uh, a frequency and you divide it up uh, among the cells. So you could have um, half the frequency assigned to the larger cells and half the frequency assigned to the smaller cells. That's one example. Uh, but there's also a time domain interference. So uh, by splitting up the frequency, you're really giving up half the capacity, right? You're, you're, you're not having to access the full spectrum or the full band of the frequency that the uh, operator purchased. Uh, so one way is actually to use all the frequency for all the cells, but assign time slots where each cell can use that frequency. So that's where you have time domain interference coordination coming to be or e with EICIC. That takes into account that uh, not all the cells are broadcasting at the same time. And when they're not, the neighbor cells could be talking or other cells that could be sending or receiving and using that same frequency to transmit or receive information. Uh, next is a Sony ANR, or self-optimizing network, uh, all the uh, neighbor, dis neighbor uh, um, discovery. So this is this goes back to to the fact that you have so many cells and so many so many users, and, and the RF environment is constantly changing. Right? They, they, there's a requirements to maximize the capacity and usage of the air interface. But uh, but since the air interface RF environment is constantly changing, you really need a way to to adjust the network in terms of um, the cell radius, in terms of power, in terms of um, of what cells are broadcasting, what frequency, and at what time, and so self-optimizing network is really a way for the network to adjust itself depending on needs. So, for example, if you just think of um, let's use a simple example of of, um, of uh, rush hour. At the end of a workday, everyone is is leaving, say, a downtown area, and they they get in a car and they tend to be mobile. So you, you probably want to shift off, uh, uh, put most of the users onto the macro cell network because if you kept most of the users still on a smaller local micro cell network, you would have so many handoffs that you have to process in the network and that doesn't, that, that really just um, uh, box down the network. And the network is, is not going to be able to handle that. So uh, um, the network has to, to, has to learn to cope with that and part of it is using intelligent algorithms to see what kind of patterns are in, in the network traffic and also what happens when certain cells become unavailable. So for example, if a cell goes out of service, the network itself has to adjust and uh, expand neighboring cell to cover that hole, that area that is no longer being covered previously. So that, that's one way to um, address that challenge. Uh, next is by carrier irrigation. So carrier irrigation really is using different carrier frequencies and coordinating them so that a the particular device could be receiving signal through, uh, or talking to the network by different base stations, by different carriers, frequencies. Um, th this is this is not particularly uh, specific to a small cell, but carrier irrigation is a way to to uh, address the interference problem. And uh, lastly, is the co uh, coordinated multipoint. This is a way for the network to actually have multiple cells broadcasting to each device, and for the device to reach the network by on the uplink. Um, it takes coordination between the, the network and the device to assign frequencies. And if you think about it, one, one particular example that I'd like to use is um, if, um, let's say, a device is in an environment where it has access to a microcell, but the access is unreliable, meaning it drops in and out. Um, so in that case, you could use the larger microcell for the control channel. Uh, control channel, as you know, has much higher robust uh, Channel quality. There's more, more, um, more uh, error correction and um, robustness to the control channel. So that could be kept at a, a macro cell. Meanwhile, the micro cell could be used to deliver user playing data. And uh, even though it's, it's not as reliable, there's fluctuation in terms of uh, quality of service. Still, um, the user can receive the data because a lot of data is, is not necessarily so time sensitive, right? Uh, if you're downloading a web page, it doesn't have to be uh, within the, the millisecond. It could have some fluctuation in terms of the coverage, but uh, in this case, it could benefit by the, uh, the, the added capacity, the increased coverage of delivering uh, the content on the smaller cells, but still maintain um, 
connection to the larger macro cell for the control channel. So that's one way of, of uh, splitting that up and gaining access to uh, increased capacity. Um, lastly, we'll talk about some of the testing challenges. So in, for small cells and headnet to really become effective, a, a cost-effective economic viable solution to increasing capacity, a lot of the devices and the network themselves have to be tested. And as I think you can see, um, deploying a headnet, a heterogeneous network with a combination of macro cell and micro cell is really quite different to deploying a network consisting mostly of macro cells. Uh, because the, the difference in power transmit level and also with the interference and, um, and the smaller cell size in terms of a handover, all those have to be considered in, to, in order to uh, have a, a cost-effective, economy viable deployment for small cells. So, so some of the testing challenges that I see that need to be, uh, that we need, need to uh, take in consideration when we introduce devices that are supporting small cells, really uh, interference management, uh, that it requires the device to be able to um, listen in and monitor more neighbor cells in each area, collect that information, do all the measurements, um, interact with the network to, to send that data and make intelligent decisions of when to do handoff, when to select one cell versus another. Uh, when to camp on one cell versus another. So that's that's actually requiring much more power, processing power in device in order to do this. Uh, another one is, uh, another challenge is really a quality of service, a quality of experience. Uh, because of introduction of uh, a backhaul network that is not, maybe not be entirely owned by the operator, there is quality of service that need, needs to be adjusted and tested. What happens in the small cells? How does a UE uh, cope with the fact that as there's large fluctuation in terms of what can be delivered over the air, what can be sent over the backhaul, and how that uh, cell selection process happen. Uh, next is data throughput, so that's that's always a, a key, but uh, in particular now because we have different cells and could be uh, uh, much lower power and have much more fluctuation in terms of uh, throughput, that, that's another area of testing. Uh, carrier gations, as we mentioned. And mobility and handover, this is uh, particularly interesting, I think, for small cells. Uh, in, in, uh, since small cells, as I mentioned, is quite small, a few hundred meters or even less in terms of uh, cell coverage, it works well for non-station person. So if someone's sitting in a coffee shop, restaurant, it's, it's fine. But if they go outside and walk about, that's still OK. But if they get in a car and start driving, the small cell coverage really is not suitable for this kind of environment. So uh, the network actually has to recognize that. The network has, has recognized the fact that someone is now moving at a certain speed or changing cells very quickly if you were to keep them on a small cell uh, uh, coverage. So the network has to make an intelligent decision to hand over to the macro cell so that that person doesn't, or that device doesn't uh, keep impacting the small cell in terms of uh, taking up the resource to handle the mobility. You know, it could be handing over from cell to cell to cell every 10 seconds or every 20 seconds. Uh, so mobility then becomes a intelligent decision um, that the network has to make to, to uh, perform a handover. And uh, lastly, and, and these are just topics, not particular, particular order or priority. I just put them on here, but I think that they're interesting and should be, be considered when you're testing uh, small cell deployment. Uh, lastly is audio quality, and uh, that relates really to QoS and quality of experience. I think um, devices, if you were to um, uh, go in indoor environment where the macro cells have a lot of path loss, right? We all experience where the call drops, like when you step in the elevator, there's actually more uh, uh, garbled speech, there's that delay, and oftentimes there's even a call drop. So that has to be um, tested and considered uh, if, if you're deploying small cells because um, there's more handoff between cells, so you don't want to introduce any kind of delay during the handoff. But there's also a need to maintain certain level of voice quality in order to um, to preserve what users really come to expect in terms of um, cellular service. Okay, so uh, in, in summary, um, I think uh, small cells are really a cost-effective ways for operator in increase uh, capacity and coverage of a network. And, I, and, and the word, the keyword here is and. It's increasing coverage and capacity. Uh, oftentimes you can increase one or the other, but not both, just by simply by de deploying more cells. Um, but uh, small cells allow the operator to do that because you can actually um, 
reach hard to cover area like underground or in, in building but uh, also increase capacity because you're actually using the same frequency and then adding more cells uh, to the network. Um, siting and backhaul really the key issues for deploying more cells because there are more cells and also because they're deployed in an environment where um, it has to blend in and it has to have uh, access to power and backhaul. But all the other factors actually also important to consider is uh, network management. Uh, the, the number of cells that a operator would need to manage actually uh, much larger, you know, it could be three, four times compared to a simple macro cell network. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, the cells have to be managed in a way in real time so that when cells drop, they, uh, any coverage host introduced can be, uh, can be uh, taken over by neighboring cells. Uh, QoS is always a, a issue there, of course. And then um, I just want to point to the fact, all this really adds up to the reality that deploying small cells is quite different from deploying macro cells. Right? Uh, macro cells have, um, have you know, much larger power output and uh, larger coverage. And, but with micro cells, there's more handoff you have to consider. There's uh, algorithms that, that have to be tested in terms of uh, handing over. If you hand over too often, there could be a ping pong effect. If you don't happen, if you don't perform a handover often enough, then there's a call drop. And so there's it's a delicate balance between the two. So things like that have to be considered uh, for small cells, especially compared to, compared to uh, macro cell deployment. And that leads to really to the next thing, uh, next conclusion, which is uh, testing devices and network in a small cell is also different from uh, testing a, a macro cell. Uh, handover is, is one scenario. There will be uh, there's actually a work in in uh, in the 3GPP release 12 now that introduced a new UE category, a new uh, device category that has intelligence to measure and make decisions about when to do handoff, how to report uh, network measurements. So that that has to be tested. Uh, that's those are new technology, new methodology that's introduced by small cell that was not previously uh, part of uh, uh, technology itself. And uh, lastly, is that uh, you know, and Ritsu, we're a test equipment provider company, and we we uh, we have, today we have uh, many solutions for LTE and LTE Advanced, and uh, we'll continue to to uh, to build on that technology uh, and uh, meet the needs of, of the market. And uh, so lastly, I just want to show show this. Um, this is uh, our product portfolio for LTE. I'll just quickly show this. Um, so we have a portfolio product covers from early development of chipset and devices on the left. Uh, you see there to uh, device integration and uh, verification as, as the column highlighted in red there. And then uh, we also have a product that tailored to carrier uh, wireless network operators in terms of carrier acceptance of devices, um, especially for new technology. Devices have to be really tested well before they can be allowed onto network. So we provide solutions for that. And lastly, we provide solution for manufacturing. Uh, for production and post sales uh, testing. So we have equipment that can actually uh, do post sale diagnostics as well as manufacturing uh, process. So um, just in summary, we have a large portfolio of product to meet testing needs for LTE demand. And uh, that really concludes the presentation part of this uh, webinar. All right, thanks and Rick. I this guess is... at this time I'd like to open up for questions. Yeah, exactly. Rick, this is Kyle again. We've had a number of questions come in, so we'll jump right in. Uh, just a note uh, for anyone that submitted a question, if we do not get it, um, Rick will get a copy of all of these questions. Um, anyways, the first question on was about slide 11 when you were talking about audio quality. Were you referring to Volti or voice over IP? Uh, really Volti. And um, so Volti is really voice over IP on an LTE network managed by IMS signaling. Right, um, voice over voice over IP could be just end-to-end -end voice over IP. For example, a Skype call, a Skype call, or a FaceTime call. That's voice over IP. But um, when I talk about Volti quality, is really um, uh, sorry. When I talk about audio quality, I'm really talking about Volti quality, and that means that um, provisioning a network and reserving resources in the network in terms of radio resources and also the back call and also the core network to carry that call end-to-end -to, -end to uh, ensure certain uh, audio quality. So um, I guess the, the short answer is I was referring to a Volti quality, Volti audio quality, uh, 
um, as opposed to just simple voice IP. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, what are some of the testing implications for device OEM and network operators to deploy het nets and small cells? Oh, yeah, that's that's actually a, a very good question. The, uh, what the, the implication for device manufacturers, uh, I, I touched upon that briefly, is that there's actually new technology, new algorithms introduced by LTE, by 3GPP, uh, to take advantage of this small cell. So there's new functionality that needs to be tested. Um, if you compare, say, a feature phone to a smartphone, and how much processing power that has today, that we see today in smartphone, I think that's similar similar um, magnitude increase in terms of going from a simple smartphone that operate in a macro cell network to a to a uh, head net. Um, and what I mean is that there are a lot of features introduced in, in uh, release 11 and especially in release 12 geared towards supporting small cells and all those features will need to be tested. Uh, for example, there are features to have the device monitor all the neighbor cells, make measurements, and report that back to the network, and even actually for the, the, the device themselves to make intelligent decision of when to request the handoff. Uh, that has been done not only now for micro cell, but also for micro cell and femto cells. And that takes into account uh, how much traffic the user is wanting to send or receive, how much interference is on one particular cell versus one that's, say, across the street at, a, at a, you know, the Starbucks versus a bookstore. All, the, all that information has to be processed. So. Um, and uh, for device manufacturer introducing uh, this type of technology, I think there's a lot of testing that needs to be that needs to uh, be considered before devices can be allowed onto the network. And similarly for device operator uh, for the network operators uh, to really take advantage of the capacity increase with small cell and head net, um, that the uh, the network and the device themselves have to be tested thoroughly tested to make sure that they they're all operating within parameters and within uh, the expected uh, behavior in terms of selecting cells, selecting handoff, and, um, and, and again, most mostly with uh, in interference mitigation. So it's those, those, those are uh, kind of long answer, but those are, so, so those are the test areas I think need to be considered. Um, we had a couple questions about power consumption. Uh, do you know what the typical power consumption of a small cell is in terms of kilowatts? Oh, um, yeah, I think, uh, let me go back to one slide. So I think this slide here, the, in terms of transmit power, it's really on the order of, of um, fractional watt to maybe one or two watts. So that's that's what the, uh, the transmit power. And a, a, a lot of the micro cells, uh, micro cell, or what in general we call small cells, that are being, uh, that are coming to market today, the total power consumption is like five watts uh, for the whole cell. So you think about, something that is like a Wi-Fi access point. It, uh, it, con it has to consume very little power, first of all, because um, you don't want to generate too much heat, and it requires active cooling. It requires much more infrastructure to, uh, to, to address that. And if, you, if, you have, if you generate so much heat, you actually have to use fans with moving parts, so that reduces the, the, the uh, lifetime of the equipment. Uh, so the goal really is to have, a, have the small cells, the equipment themselves, run on on the order of a few watts, and uh, that way, it, you know, it can be easy to deploy. They're lightweight. There's no moving parts, uh, and uh, well, ultimately, they're also low cost. Does that not that answer your question? I, I think that seemed to hit it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, next question: Could you provide a little more detail about 4G relay or wireless backhaul? Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, you know. Uh, backhaul, there's really two types of backhaul, wired and wireless, right? Uh, wired backhaul is using fiber or, um, uh, or gigabit, gigabit Ethernet. And that's really um, the choice for operator that has that kind of infrastructure. So, for example, if you're in a city, that may be, it may have already have fiber installed and, and it's available. But uh, in some locations, it, that may not be available. In that case, you have to use um, the LTE network itself as a backhaul. So the macro cell then becomes... Um, the, the network that the smaller cell has to backhaul into, and so uh, one one possible scenario is that the uh, the small cells could have a directional antenna to reach a uh, micro cell that's on top of a building, and then the the micro cell itself would have another uh, antenna to provide local coverage 
at you know at the bus stop or the street level or the street corner. So that's that's one way to use a wireless for backhaul. You can actually uh, in LTE in the 3GPP standards, there's actually a facility to, to do that. You can actually use um, actually let me go to this diagram. Uh, yeah, if you see in in, the, in this picture here, the uh, blue arrow, the blue curve arrow in the middle of the picture, it says 4G relay backhaul. So that's you using um, LT itself as a backhaul. And uh, so the 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 Metro Pico cell there really has no backhaul. In this case, you think about let's say deploying a small cell at a bus stop. Uh, there's no access to fiber, Ethernet. It's outdoor environment. It all has its electrical AC power, and uh, it can run the cell. And so that way, in, in this scenario, the best way is to really backhaul into the larger network through the through the micro cell. And next question coming in. Oh, and um, I guess um, there's also option. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, continue. I'm sorry. There's a. Okay. So yeah. Sorry. There's a slight delay. I was gonna say um, LT is not the only way to do wireless backhaul. You can actually use microwave as well, but it's uh, not so cost effective. Um, but uh, that's why we choose 4G relay as a backhaul. Great. Uh, another question is, um, is there a reduced cost benefit to small cell if you're deploying a large number of sites? Uh, well, certainly. Uh, the, the, each cell themselves costs less than a macro cell. And um, th they also tend to be portable, too. So, for example, if, um, um, th if uh, for example, there's a event and you quickly need to deploy coverage, um, let's say a I don't know, it's just an ultimate case. Uh, let's say there's an Olympic event and you want to provide coverage in, say, in, you know, a few years ago in the Olympics in London. Um, deploying small cells is actually quite effective because you, you can do it at street level. Uh, a bit you have, um, although you have more cells to deploy, you can actually deploy those cells very quickly. Um, they're easy to deploy because they're lightweight, they're at street level. You don't need a crane or you don't build, need to build a tower to put them up. And um, the cost themselves, of course, is lower for, for the equipment. And uh, I think another benefit is that small cells, uh, because they're, they're, you would have so many of them in each area, they can actually be powered on and powered off um, according to needs. So for example, during business hours, more cells could be on in a downtown environment. And then after hours on the weekend, you can actually turn them off. You don't need to keep running them. Uh, the, the larger macro cell could pro provide coverage, and, uh, but you don't need the capacity that you would normally during the work week. So uh, small cells has that advantage where you can actually turn off the cells if you're not using them, and then turn them back on if there's any uh, any any traffic in that area, or if there's any increased traffic where um, the micro cell cannot handle it. Do you think fre frequency spectrum will be allocated to small cells versus macro cells in some sort of standard? Um, it, it could be, but uh, it's not really necessary because uh, the small cells could operate at the same frequency as a macro cell. And in fact, that's how we really take advantage of the increased capacity. You use all the uh, frequency spectrum, all the frequency band that that operator has, and use them for both the macro and the micro. Um, you could split them up, and that's one way really to reduce the interference. But uh, depending on what the goal is, it, it, you might be better served, an operator might be better served to actually use all the frequencies. So um, I, I don't, really don't see a need to actually allocate certain frequency to micro self versus micro self, um, except the fact that micro self, because they're much lower power, they do have the ability to run or use unlicensed band. So for example, well, one, one model is that the micro self use licensed band and uh, the femto cells could use unlicensed band. And uh, so you've heard of things like um, you know, LTEU, LTEU, uh, unlicensed LTE, which really use the, the same band that Wi-Fi uses in the 5.4 5, 5 gigahertz in conjunction with the license band that the operator has. So, so that's a way to provide coverage indoor um, by using unlicensed band that's available uh, or uh, allowable to be used and use that in conjunction with uh, macro self. And that, that is one scenario where you can use uh, uh, the example I used earlier, earlier where control channel stays on a macro cell and the user playing traffic goes to a micro cell. So that, that's that's one way to do that. Uh, but I think to answer the question, do we really need to have separate band license for micro cell versus macro cell? I would say uh, not necessarily. Um, if the, if the uh, the frequency is available, it's it's actually better to use it, use it all for all the cells. 
Um, another question. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about CRAN and VRAN in the industry lately. Would you consider that an evolution of small cells? I'm sorry, can you repeat the first part? Um, we've just in the industry in general, we've been hearing a lot about CRAN and VRAN lately. Would you consider those uh, an evolution of small cells? Uh, as, actually, I'm not so familiar with with the two terms. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will have to uh, take that as a as a as a question I can respond to later. Okay. Um, so early in the presentation, you referred to backhaul. Would you describe that as? Um, how would you describe a self reconfigure in a network, in terms of backhaul? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So backhaul, um, and and that goes back to the fact that backhaul is not necessarily owned, uh, managed, or operated by the network operator. So oftentimes, um, if you take the example on this picture on the left there, it's a uh, fentanyl cell that could be deployed indoors. So for example, I could be, um, uh, I could go to my operator, I say I want a better coverage, and he say, well, we don't have, you know, you have the option of actually installing a fentanyl cell in your home. So the, what the fentanyl cell does is actually use my um, internet access in order to backhaul into the, their network. And uh, in, that, in that case, the uh, the backhaul is not owned and controlled by the operator, but the operator still has the obligation to provide a certain level of service. For example, if I make a call on my phone but connects to my femto cell, it still has to be able to support voice quality of a certain extent. And so that means that the network itself has to be able to um, uh, make intelligent decisions in terms of what happens if I start to lose uh, capacity in my backhaul. Um, my calls then should hand over to the to macro cell. But in terms of the backhaul management, there's um, uh, let, let's take an example like a uh, outdoor environment or a, uh, a public space environment where there are many macro cells. Uh, some macro cells could be uh, high, highly loaded, you know, a, lot, a lot of traffic on there. It could be become available because there's a cable cut. In that case, all the neighboring cells would have to be adjusted and in, in order to provide that coverage. And, uh, and of course, the backhaul itself has to be monitored to see that capacity is available to increase coverage in that area. Um, it, it, it's, 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 think about it as an ever-changing environment and that you really have to monitor it. And uh, so if we plan a network ahead of time and provision it, it probably won't be able to respond so quickly in terms of uh, when there's outage. But if you have automatic um, detection of network fluctuations, network coverage drops, you can quickly respond to that and the network has, of course can can be made to make uh, intelligent decisions of how to um, how to fill in those holes, how to provide coverage to those areas. All I, right. I think that's what the question was asking. Yeah, I think you hit it. Um, okay. So we have time for just one more question. Earlier you talked about release 12. Can you talk about some of the features with that that would support HetNet and small cells? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so release 12, I, I believe it's it's uh, to be functionally frozen, I think, in March, so f uh, fairly soon. And there has been a lot of work items in 3GPP to uh, address many different areas. Uh, there's areas to address uh, EMBMS broadcasts, but one of them was actually to address HetNet and small cells. So I think uh, some of the work that's going on right now for, for small cell um, really focuses on the inference mitigation. Uh, one is what I talked about earlier is cells can actually be turned on and off. So say after hours, it's better to actually turn off the small cells because there's more mobile traffic traffic. I mean, in vehicles. So therefore, more traffic should be handed on them to uh, to a macro cell. Uh, there's actually procedures and and uh, and algorithms to uh, define to help you uh, devices detect and hand over to small cells. So there's there's way for the device to actually discover if there's more cells in the area and when they should be handing off to those small cells or handing back to larger cells. There's actually uh, work going on to define that, that those kind of algorithm procedures. Uh, another one is, is what they call dual connectivity, and this is where the device, um, as I mentioned, it has is using the macro cell for control plane traffic and using the uh, the local small cells. For the user traffic. That's actually, I think, a very interesting way of increasing capacity. Um, another way is, is uh, I think I briefly mentioned that, that's the uh, UE enhancement. So there's enhancements to UE. There's actually a new uh, device category defined 
that has a capability to uh, perform what's called network network assisted interference cancellation suppression. So the the uh, the network can actually and and the and the device can actually work together to see where there's interference and select different resources, different frequency or different channel or different time slot um, to reduce the interference between devices or between uh, cells so that uh, it actually um, increases the, uh, the, the, the throughput by, uh, by reducing the interference. There's, um, let's see, there's also, uh, uh, well, yeah, and actually related to that, there's actually an uh, interface. It's, the cells are use, using the X2 interface between between uh, Eno Beast in order to coordinate that interference. So there's actually a lot of work uh, on the device side and also on network side to, to manage this interference. And um, I mean, there's actually even new UE category defined uh, that has a capability. So I think that's, that's actually a very positive step in the uh, release 12. That's about all the time we have for today's webinar, HetNet and Small Cells presented by Enritu. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending, and I want to thank our presenter today, Rick Fung, Strategic Business Development Manager at Enritu. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you very much.